Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's now November and our spooky month is behind us, and this month we'll be covering mostly superhero movies. As today, at the channel points request of my mom, yes, yeah, right, I made my mom use channel points. Nobody gets special treatment around here, you want to fight about it? We're going to review Superman, released in 1978. Directed by Richard Donner, who would later go on to direct films such as the Goonies, Scrooge, and Lethal Weapon series, Superman was not only the first high-budget production of the character, but the first ever high-budget production of a superhero movie. And by high budget, I mean high budget. This film had a budget of $55 million, and by today's standards, it might not seem like a lot, but at the time, in 1978, it was actually the most expensive film ever made. And they made that back in more in droves, as it earned a cool $300 million at the box office. Which is pretty good, considering it only released in four countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and Panama, which is a weird combination of places. The film, of course, follows the origin story of the superhero Superman as he learns his powers and eventually comes to try to stop the supervillain Lex Luthor. The film had an incredible all-star cast, including Christopher Reeve as Superman and Margot Kidder as his love interest Lois Lane. Lex Luthor was played by Gene Hackman, who we've previously covered on the channel in films such as Unforgiven and The Poseidon Adventure. And Luthor's cronies, Miss Tessmacher and Otis, were played by Valerie Perrine and Ned Beatty, who we previously covered on the channel a couple weeks ago in the awful disaster of a film that was The Exorcist 2, which was actually released just a year before this. Also, Superman's biological father, Jor-El, was played by Marlon Brando, who would later actually go on to sue Warner Brothers for $50 million because he felt like he was cheated out of his share of the box office profits, which is probably the most Marlon Brando thing I've ever ever heard in my entire life. The film received critical acclaim, especially for Reeves' performance and the musical score done by John Williams. It also spawned a whole franchise, including a sequel, Superman 2, which was released two years later in 1980. Superman 2 was actually filmed simultaneously with Superman 1, but due to tension between the producers and Richard Donner, it was stopped and they finished the first film, while the second film was about 75% completed. And of course we cannot ignore this film's incredible legacy as it was not only the jumpstart for every high budget superhero film following it, but also the jumpstart for the major superhero boom in the 21st century. But how exactly did Superman come to be and how did he stop Lex Luthor in this one? Well, we're going to find out right now as we take a look back at Superman, released in 1978. So our film begins with an incredibly long opening credit sequence. No joke, it's like five minutes long. Our film then actually begins on the planet Krypton, which is located right behind a giant red sun. They are currently holding trial for three apparent traitors of Krypton, General Zod and his accomplices Ursa and Nan. They are all found guilty of their crimes and banished to the Phantom Zone, which does not sound fun. And if you want to know more about these characters, well you will, eventually, in Superman 2. The Speaker of the Council, Jor-El, then holds a meeting over something he's discovered. Apparently, the planet Krypton in 30 days' time is actually going to explode, pretty much, because it's moving too far away from its supergiant sun. The other council members do not believe him, however, and threaten him with treason if he tries to tell others about his theories. He also promises that him and his wife Laura will not leave the planet, but he didn't say anything about his son, Kal-El. He's decided to send Kal-El to the planet Earth, where his molecular structure will give him superhuman abilities and powers. He sets Kal-El up in a ship filled with crystals, and before he sets it off, he adds one more mysterious green crystal. He fires his son off to Earth, and then immediately after, the planet Krypton begins to crumble and then just straight up explodes. Kal-El then travels through space for up to three years until he finally breaches the Earth's atmosphere. His ship crash lands in Smallville, Kansas, right in front of couple Jonathan and Marfa Kent. Marfa wants to adopt him as she never had a son, but Jonathan's not so sure that he's really an alien until he lifts up the truck. We then fast forward 15 years later. Kal-El is now named Clark, he's 18 years old, and he's a water boy and equipment manager for the football team. Also, fun fact, teenage Clark Kent was played by Jeff East, who rose to prominence for being the live-action version of Huckleberry Finn. East's voice was actually not used for the film, though. They dubbed him over with Christopher Reeve's voice, because I guess they wanted to keep the voice consistent. And much like his father predicted, the now Clark does have some superhuman abilities, as he punts a football to the moon and then plays chicken with a train. 
He's a little down in the dumps because he's kind of an outcast because he can't really showcase his full abilities, but his father cheers him up by telling him that he was put here for a reason. And then approximately 30 seconds after this conversation takes place, his father Jonathan has a heart attack and fucking dies. A few days later at night after the funeral, Clark hears something calling to him. He goes to their barn where he finds the remains of his spaceship and the thing calling to him, that mysterious green crystal. The next day he tells his mother that he's gotta go and he goes alright, he goes all the way to the fucking Arctic. He then yeets the green crystal into the Arctic, which forms a giant crystal fortress, which he enters in the hopes of achieving some solitude. He then activates a hologram of his father, who tells him his true origins, and offers to teach him all the things he needs to know about his abilities. Among the important things that Jorah tells him is that he must never manipulate human history. And even though it doesn't take very long for Clark, it actually takes the equivalent of 12 Earth years to tell him all these things. Clark then emerges from the Fortress of Solitude 12 Earth years later with the full getup and full realization of his powers. Clark then decides to move to Metropolis, which is basically a New York City parody, where he gets a job at the Daily Planet as a news reporter. He also meets and forms a bond with fellow reporter Lois Lane, who he seems to immediately have a crush on. Clark is in full disguise as well, acting completely nervous and clumsy and not at all sure of himself, but he does save them from getting mugged by catching a speeding bullet. Meanwhile, two police officers are chasing a man named Otis, who's believed to be a henchman of the villain Lex Luthor. Otis then escapes into an underground train track lair, while Luthor disposes of one of the police officers. Lufor then tells Otis as well as his other associate, Eve Tessmacher, that he plans to hijack and reprogram some missiles that are due to be tested to help his real estate scam, which is a sentence that does not currently make sense, but later on it will. Meanwhile, later one night, Lois is going up in a helicopter for some sort of news story, but the helicopter gets caught on a cord and quickly spins out of control. It ends up dangling over the edge of the Daily Planet building, and Lois is almost falling out of the helicopter. Clark then sees this going on and for the first time publicly transforms into his costume and saves her. And since everyone knows he's out there now, he just decides to get to work. He stops a jewel thief, he captures some robbers who are trying to get away on a ship and then delivers said ship to the police station. He rescues a cute cat from a tree and saves Air Force One and by virtue the President of the United States after their engine is destroyed by a lightning strike. He's been dubbed the Caped Wonder and people want to know more about him, so later that night he flies to Lois' house to give her the interview. He tells her all about himself and then offers to take her on a flight, and they end up flying all through Metropolis. After he drops her off back at her home, she gives him his official name of Superman. The article then goes out, which is read by Lex Luthor, who after realizing that Superman is from Krypton, deduces that a meteorite discovered recently actually contains kryptonite from the planet Krypton, and kryptonite can actually only damage one type of people, people from Krypton. Lufor and friends then execute that earlier plan of reprogramming those missiles, distracting the convoy by having Miss Tessmacher pose as a car crash victim. Meanwhile, Lois has gone out to the Californian desert to do a report on why all the land was purchased by some random billionaire. Clark, who's at work meanwhile, then gets a high-frequency message from Lex Lufor telling him to come meet him in his base, which he does. Lufor then lays out his master plan to Superman. Basically, it was him that purchased all that desert land in California because he reprogrammed one of the missiles to hit the San Andreas Fault, which will effectively destroy San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and everything on that side of the fault line, so everything that he bought on the other side of the fault line will have to become all the new land for the surviving California residents to live at, and if he'll be able to make a whole bunch of money selling the real estate. And to sum all that up in less than 10 words, California go bye-bye, Lex make big money. The missiles have already been launched and Lex tells Superman that the only way to stop them is to hit the detonator, which is in a lead chest, lead being the only thing Superman can't see through. However, once Superman opens the chest, it's actually revealed to be a giant kryptonite necklace, which completely immobilizes him. Lex pushes him in a pool and leaves him to die before remarking that a second missile has also been reprogrammed to a random location of Hackensack, New Jersey, just for fun, I guess. Miss Tessmacher is horrified to learn this, though, as her mother lives there, to which Lex does not give a shit. 
Miss Tessmacher then decides to save Superman under the condition that he save her mother in New Jersey first because she knows that he can't lie. Superman flies off and does just that, stopping the eastbound missile. Right as he does that, however, the other missile hits the San Andreas Fault, which begins destroying California, including the Golden Gate Bridge and the Hoover Dam. Which is interesting, because the Hoover Dam is not located in California, but I guess it is here. He then goes about doing damage control, including repairing the fault line somehow, saving a school bus, saving a train, and saving fellow reporter Jimmy Olsen from drowning in the dam. Meanwhile, things are not going too well for Lois as her car has stalled and she falls into a sinkhole and an avalanche collapses on top of her. Speaking of avalanches, Superman creates his own avalanche to stop the water from the Hoover Dam from hitting a nearby town. Superman then hears Lois's cries and digs her car out of the sinkhole, but he's too late as Lois has already suffocated to death. He then kisses her now dead body, which is technically necrophilia when you think about it. He then lets out a primal scream and flies into the sky where he remembers Jor-El's warning to not manipulate human history. However, he then remembers Jonathan saying that he was put on Earth for a reason and decides to go with that instead. He then flies around the Earth and reverses the Earth's rotation, which somehow also reverses time, sure, I guess that's how that works, which stops California from being destroyed and also stops Lois from dying. After he makes sure Lois is okay, he flies away, and Lois might be about to connect the dots between Superman and Clark, but then she's like, nah, that's ridiculous. Superman then delivers Otis and Lex Luthor, who's actually bald, to prison before flying off into the night sky to save more people. God, Christopher Reeve was a handsome man. Before I continue with the end of this review, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how many of the main cast has unfortunately passed away since this movie came out. Marlon Brando died in the year 2004 at the age of 80. Christopher Reeve was tragically paralyzed in the year 1995 before dying in the year 2004 at the age of 52. Ned Beatty died at the age of 83 in June of this year. Margot Kidder died at the age of 69 in 2018. However, Valerie Perrain is still alive at the age of 78, and Gene Hackman will be 92 in January. So after watching this movie, it is incredible how this basically formed the formula for what we have now. I mean, when you think about it, this movie is incredibly similar to superhero movies nowadays. It has a great plot, it has great all-star cast, it has a good superhero versus supervillain narrative, it has great special effects, it has everything you want. And of course, not to mention the music by John Williams, who in my opinion is probably the greatest movie musical composer of all time. And it is incredible how well this still holds up. Some of the special effects don't, like the obvious green screen effects at some point, but you put the plot of this up against any superhero film we have now today, and it definitely still holds its own. There are few portrayals of superheroes that have been better than Christopher Reeve as Superman. Nobody has ever done Superman better, I'll tell you that. And definitely nobody's done Lex Luthor better than Gene Hackman. And if you're a big superhero film fan and you haven't seen this movie, you're doing yourself a massive disservice because every single superhero franchise is pretty much as a result of this. Everyone you love is accredited basically to this movie. Sam Raimi Spider-Man, The Dark Knight Trilogy, the MCU itself all probably wouldn't have happened in the way that they happened and with the popularity that they had if it wasn't for this film. So does that make this the greatest superhero film of all time? I think that's a bit subjective. Does that make this the most important superhero film of all time? Absolutely yes. And like most great superhero films, it was followed up with a great superhero film sequel, Superman 2, released in 1980, which we will cover on the channel at some point. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for my Superman look back at Superman, released in 1978. Thank you to Mom for using your channel points on this. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys all for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to leave it a like. Uh, if you want to follow any of my social media links, they are all in the description down below. Thank you to all my patrons for supporting me and all my channel. I appreciate you guys. With all that being said, though, my name is Noah Taff. This has been my review of Superman, released in 1978, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.